Harrison sat on the banks of the Tennessee River. Welcome to this 30-minute edition of Three in Your Town, where we celebrate the people, the places, and the things that make this area so unique and so wonderful. And speaking of wonderful, springtime in the Tennessee Valley is just enough reason to celebrate. The birds are chirping, things are in bloom, you can't breathe, but that's okay. That too shall pass, just in time for mosquito season. When we're talking about things in bloom, of course, that would be the trees, like the dogwood trees and the tulip poplars. And if you're not familiar with the Tulip Poplar, a trip to the Joyce Kilmer Memorial Forest uh, might be something that you'd be interested in. The trees there, the old growth there, uh, some of these Tulip Poplars can grow 100 feet in height and 20 feet in circumference. Now those aren't the original big boys of the East Coast. That title would actually go to the American Chestnut. The American Chestnut, though, functionally extinct at this point. Uh, well, we wanted to find out why and if there was a chance that the American Chestnut could make a comeback. The giant redwoods here in Northern California are truly unmatched in terms of their size and their scope. That wasn't always necessarily the case. In fact, up until about 120 years ago, the East Coast version of these redwoods, the American chestnut tree, could easily grow 100 to 150 feet in height. They were truly the backbone of the ecosystem ranging from Maine all the way down to Florida. A blight in the early to mid 1900s took these beautiful trees to the brink of extinction. Luckily, there's a group in the Tennessee Valley trying to bring them back. You can see chestnuts all over the place. So, like there's some here at Reflection Riding occurring on the property. They're really all over the mountains. The problem is they can't grow old enough to flower and set fruit and reproduce on its own. So what they do is after a few years, generally before you know five years old, they're gonna get the blight and it's gonna be a fungal pathogen, again, that uh, attacks the cambium, which is uh, the inner bark layer. Um, and it ends up girdling the tree and killing it, but it kills it before it can flower. The blight is a fungal pathogen that occurs naturally on Asian chestnuts. It evolved with the Chinese and Asian chestnut trees. But in 1904, when those Asian chestnuts were introduced into the Bronx Zoo, that fungus crossed onto the American chestnut and wiped out an estimated 4 billion trees on more than 200 million acres in North America. On top of that disaster, there was a campaign to log the chestnut wood prematurely to salvage any lumber possible. Some of those could have been potentially um immune to the blight. That would have been really good genetics to have, like anything that kind of outlasted the original blight. That could be, you know, stuff you could breed off of. That could be what brings back the American chestnut. Groups like the American Chestnut Foundation are trying to reverse the catastrophic loss. So this actually right here is a hybrid chestnut. This particular tree is a back cross hybrid. Um, so it's part Chinese chestnut and part American chestnut. This is basically just plant breeding. We're trying to uh, Intergress genes from the Chinese chestnut that makes it resistant to the blight and put those genes in the American chestnut while taking out uh, the genes that are that we don't like about the Chinese chestnut. They have different forms. So the Chinese chestnut has a much more broader open shape to it where the American chestnut would have shot up like a rocket up in the forest. This is an effort that stretches all along the Appalachian Range. The New York chapter I know is doing um, some GMO trees, which sounds very scary, but what they're doing is actually taking a gene from wheat and uh, that is that makes the tree immune to Cryphonectria, Cryphonectria parasitica, which is the blight, the fungal disease that causes blight. Um, so with this inserted wheat gene, they're actually immune. Um, they're 100% American besides that one little gene and they're completely immune to the blight. There is a way that you can help these functionally extinct icons. If you see something, say something. Like if, if you find a chestnut out in the woods and it's actually got chestnuts on it, that's gold. And that should be sent to um, you know, a professional that can start breeding those. Of course, uh, other things that happen in the springtime, people are getting out and they're exercising. And of course, what better place is there to exercise than the Riverwalk here in Chattanooga? It's a true gem uh, of the entire Tennessee Valley. Uh, one of the things though we were curious about, if you've ever run along the Amnicola portion of the Tennessee Riverwalk, 
What, in fact, is an amnicola? Amnicola was the name of a large estate once owned by Thomas Crutchfield Jr. The Amnicola property stretched from Sitico Creek all the way to South Chickamauga Creek and east to the base of Missionary Ridge. Crutchfield moved to Chattanooga in 1848 from Athens, Tennessee. Upon his father's death in 1850, Thomas Crutchfield took over operation of Chattanooga's largest hotel, the Crutchfield House, which stood on the site of today's Reed House Hotel. He served as mayor in 1859, but in the late winter of 1861, as the country approached the Civil War, Thomas Crutchfield sold his hotel in an attempt to avoid any sort of conflict between North and South. He moved his family to safety at an outlying farm that he named Amnicola, which in Latin means dwelling by the river. Today, his farmland along the river is part of the Tennessee Riverwalk Master Plan. Miles of beauty designed to capture, enhance, and display the human, natural, cultural, and environmental history of the Tennessee River Valley and its people. So we've talked about the beauty of the outdoors in nature. Of course, there's a lot of beauty to be had in the springtime here in Chattanooga in the urban environments. And it's a very friendly opportunity for people to get out and take pictures for their uh, social media or just a keepsake for something down the road. Well, I hung out with a buddy of mine, Justin Brickler, to find out what inspires him as a photographer and what keeps him going out with his camera. Ah, the joy. You can capture a lot of people's joy in photography. You just never know where a picture can lead you or just walking down an alley could lead you. You never know who you're going to meet, what story they may have. I think that's just kind of, it's kind of the essence of being a journalist. Photography and journalism definitely go hand in hand. Justin is actually compiling a list of Chattanooga's most popular and also some undiscovered photo locations. From Umbrella Alley to the pedestrian walking bridge, countless photos have been taken of the scenic city staples. There are all sorts of reasons for this. It's a time capsule for many celebrating the artistry in architecture and design. Uh, for others, it's to capture a moment with a friend or a loved one on a memorable day. I mean, we all love to get those great photos for social media just to show off, you know? It, it doesn't matter who you are, what's your age. You like to show off a little bit, it's all good. <laughs> We love it. We love it. There are unlimited opportunities throughout the city. It's simply the expression of creative skill and imagination. It can be anywhere and it can be anything to anyone. Three murals, three different photographers, but they all have the same camera. And I guarantee you they'll all have a different point of view of what they're seeing. And I think that's no matter if you're looking at the same thing, everyone has a different point of view. And that's pretty great. That's pretty cool. Coming up after the break, we are taking a paddle to Old Harrison, a town flooded by TVA in the late 1930s and early 1940s. This is a really neat place to take friends, family, the kiddos, and you learn a little bit of local history and national history. We took a very short paddle from a public boat ramp. An easy paddle, um, a family could come out here very easily, and then you could go back home and do a little more research and, uh, and enriches, the, enriches the lives of our community members. Prior to 1940, the old town of Harrison sat on the banks of the Tennessee River. Then a series of intricate dams was introduced for the betterment of the Tennessee Valley. At that point, it was decided that the old town of Harrison would be submerged in water. But for a few months out of the year when lake levels are low, the old town of Harrison is revealed. Thanks to Outdoor Chattanooga, we had the opportunity to come out and explore what once was. The purpose of the dam was to control flooding downstream in the Chattanooga community. But what happened to those upstream? They got a knock on the door telling them they had a few weeks to get their affairs into order before the waters would rise and their homes, lands, and houses would be consumed by the lake. Construction of the Chickamauga Dam began in 1936 and was actually completed in just four years. TVA says Chickamauga and other reservoirs on the Tennessee River and its tributaries have prevented nearly $5 billion in flood damage in the city of Chattanooga alone. During his dedication in 1940, FDR proclaimed this Chickamauga Dam, built by the Tennessee Valley Authority for the people of the United States, is helping to give to all of us 
human control of the watershed of the Tennessee River in order that it may serve in full the purposes of men. And these little tiny squares are uh, the indications um, here in the map of about 25, 30 different buildings, sites. You can see actual road beds and paths that it took. More than 70 years later now, a trip to this cluster of islands revealed the footprint of the town, its businesses and homes, and even the original portion of Highway 58. It's a humbling adventure to be had, a town lost for the progress of a nation. Sometimes sacrifices need to be made to better the future, but it can be hard to have that forward thinking. If you're planning a trip to Old Harrison, you got to make sure that the lake levels are still low, and it is recommended that you go in the morning before the wind causes the water to be choppy. A public boat ramp you can launch from would be Wakanda. Put it in your GPS, take you there. You'll have an enjoyable day. The entire family will love it. All right, coming up after the break, we are taking a trip to Reflection Riding to find about their Raptor program and how you can actually not only help the Raptors there, but the Raptors in the wild by simply doing things like not throwing your apple out the window. We'll tell you more after the break. Harrison sat on the banks of the Tennessee River. Welcome back to this 30 minute edition of Three in Your Town, where we continue to celebrate the people, the places, and the things that make the Tennessee Valley so wonderful. Listen, before we go any further, if you think you have an idea what might make a good story, please reach out, let me know. Uh, we'd love to feature new things, new places that we haven't explored yet, and we have much, much more to come throughout this season, so we might add uh, your story to the list. All right, uh, let's go to Reflection Writing right now and talk about their Raptor program. Uh, absolutely uh, fantastic stuff that they're doing, and uh, we'll let you know a little bit later on how you can actually help out. In the early morning hours at Reflection Riding, you might come across some of the staff members here taking their birds on a walk. Though that may seem counterintuitive, the fact that injuries have rendered these birds flightless means their senses need to be stimulated in another way. So going for a simple walk for you and I down a path uh, where, you know, you see some really cool things, uh, through his eyes, you're seeing a whole other world because the way bird vision works is totally different than the way human vision works. Understanding how different our vision actually is opens your eyes to why these bird walks are so important. So we as humans, we have one point of focus inside of our eyes. Uh, it's called a fovea. And so we can look at one thing and focus on that at a time. These guys have two foveas or two points of focus inside of their eyes. If I stuck my finger up in the air, they could look at my finger and look at my foot the exact same time. As opportunistic eaters, the ability to see two things at once is imperative. So they can be flying over a field and looking where they're going while also looking down to hunt at the same time. To see colors, we humans rely on cones in our retina. They are our photoreceptors. The retina of a human has about six million cones that broken down see red, green, and blue. That of course seems like a lot, but in actuality, it pales in comparison to birds of prey. They can see so many more details about the world around us than we can perceive. Raptors have the most highly evolved eyesight of all living organisms. They see on a spectrum of color much wider than ours. Many birds can actually see into the ultraviolet spectrum. So what that means, basically, things that we can't physically see when we look at stuff sticks out very bright to them. Uh, one thing that they actually use to their advantage is um, they can actually see urea, which is found in urine. So if they're hunting a rabbit and it's running across the ground, and uh, it happens to urinate as it's running, they can follow that rabbit because they can see its urine trail. Their final trick is an enhanced ability to see things at a much closer time than humans. It's something called flicker fusion frequency, or FFF. Humans can see approximately 20 events per second. Thor and other raptors have an FFF of 80 events per second. What that means is he is seeing things in slow motion. 
Um, the best way to describe it is uh, if you're watching a movie and you hit the pause button and still frame it, frame by frame by frame by frame, that's the way he sees life. What that does in the wild is it allows them to move at a very accelerated rate and adjust for quick things that happen on, um, on the fly. So if he's flying through the forest at 50 miles an hour and uh, the wind blows and a branch moves, he has to be able to sense that and adjust his body so he doesn't slam into it. It's an amazing bit of science and it's available for everyone to explore at Reflection Riding Arboretum and Nature Center. All right, so we gotta tell you, quit throwing your apples out the window. I know, I know. I am pointing the finger at myself first. I have done this countless times in my entire life and uh, until I talked to Tish Gailmard at Reflection Riding, I had no idea the impact that made on raptors in our area. Uh, she'll explain. This is Ember, she's a red-shouldered hawk and you can see on this side she has a full wing and on this side she is a partial amputee. You can see this wing is not full. So she is no longer flighted and can no longer survive in the forest. Ember is just one example of the many injured animals that Reflection Riding cares for. Raptors in particular are susceptible to injury as they react to prey in an ever-evolving landscape, often by the conditions humans create. You are driving down the road, you've got your apple core, and you throw it out on the side of the road thinking it'll biodegrade. It sits on the side of the road biodegrading. It takes some time to do that. And while it's sitting there, it attracts rodents. Mice, squirrels, chipmunks, and these gorgeous birds of prey are the ones attracted to those rodents. So they swoop down to grab their dinner or swoop back up and get hit by a car. The goal of Tish and the entire staff at Reflection is not to chastise or to guilt trip. It's simply to educate. If I can teach one or two people that story, then they're gonna tell everybody else. And so it's that wonderful ripple effect and the education continues through all the people that they talk to, but then hopefully to next generations as well. A little bit of education goes a very, very long way. Always check out Reflection Riding. They're doing wonderful stuff there. We'll feature them uh, many more times this season. All right, after the break, we are headed to the kitchen. Uh, Claire and myself have been getting into this cooking routine under quarantine. Got a couple of good recipes. We're gonna share one with you. A pizza pull apart bread. That's coming up on the other side of this break. Welcome back to the kitchen, everybody. Getting ready for Sunday's big game. Going over recipes that our head Claire and I were. Say hi, Claire. Hi, Claire. And, and you know what? We actually made a really good recipe last year. That we made lots of good recipes. We made lots of <laughs> lots of good recipes last year. But one especially that would be good for this Sunday was the um, pizza pull apart monkey bread. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's super easy to make. So we figured we can now take this time to just talk about the history of the Super Bowl. No, okay. Let's just talk about food. Here's a throwback. So the first thing you want to do here is cut up biscuits into uh, quarter, quarter size pieces. Yeah. So this is the thing that Claire won't do because she's, she doesn't like this, the sound. I start easily. <laughs> so this is my responsibility. In the meanwhile, uh, she's going to be cutting up some basil. We're putting pepperonis in with the oil and the spices. Yep. We're also going to throw in the mozzarella cheese as well. Yeah. And then we're going to and we're, and we're going to throw that into the bunt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uh, recipe originally when we borrow these ideas, it said one bag of mozzarella cheese. But my friend Ellie had a pro tip that that is not enough. Uh -huh. So it calls for two cups. You should do two and a half cups. That's why Allie's a genius. Genius. I'm going to use my God Givens and just bunt it up. Bunt, bunt. If, any, <laughs> if anybody is curious why we haven't used the marinara or the pizza sauce at this point, it's really clear just kind of uses a dipping sauce, correct? Yeah. Oh my goodness gracious. Oh boy. 
Right. Oh my god, it's gracious. Look at that. If it was just about appearance and smell, already this is the best thing that we've made. It smells really good. Now, we need to flip the bunt pizza into uh, this serving container. What are the chances this works out? And it would be magical if it did. What kind? Ah! Shit! <laughs> oh, so and then so we just pour marinara on top of this? No, no, no you dip. So like oh. you tear off, you have little dippers. You oh. can pour it or you could dip. When I dip, do you dip? Then we dip, you dip, I dip. <laughs> You're gonna need this. I'm getting emotional. That's really good. You want to see a big bite? Don't do that. That's not the whole thing. This is going to be great television. No. <laughs> hey, seriously, thank you very much for watching this 30 minute edition of Three in Your Town. This is something that we're going to continue to do uh, throughout the season here, in addition to the stories that we tell on Channel 3 throughout the week. Uh, if you have an idea, again, let me know. All my information is pretty easy to find. I love to explore new places, meet new people. Uh, until the next time we meet though, enjoy this weather. It's absolutely wonderful. You live in the Tennessee Valley in the springtime. You live where people come to vacation. Old County Robinson. Old Town of Harrison sat on the banks of the Tennessee River.